and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, as the two sessions wrap up, China is set to clamp down on financial risks, with a new central bank governor expected to keep a healthy balance between growth and stability. And Chinese Premier Li Keqiang rules out expansionism and emphasizes good relations with all nations toward a shared future as the cornerstone of China's foreign policy. You're watching World Inside. Chinese President Xi Jinping has reaffirmed his commitment to serve the people and fulfill his legal obligations. President Xi made the remarks during the eighth and final plenary meeting of the first session of the 13th National People's Congress. He stressed the wealth of China's history and the confidence he has in the country's future. As the top legislature passed a host of bills, work reports, and budget plans, the president gave a speech. It is a noble duty and a great responsibility to serve as a president of the People's Republic of China. Today, more than ever, the Chinese people are closer to realizing the dream of national rejuvenation. Over the past 40 years, China has risen from a poor, industrialized nation to become the world's second largest economy. Last week, the NPC passed a series of amendments to China's constitution, which includes articles to ensure a continuity in leadership and a more independent supervisory commission to fight corruption. We must always be people-oriented. We must let the people be the masters of the nation. We must learn from our people, listen to their voices, and act on their wisdom. What the people advocate, what the people approve and accept must be the sole measurement of all of our work. Xi Jinping pledged that China would never seek hegemony nor expansionism, saying that only those who regularly threaten other countries would perceive other countries as a threat. Strong confidence but tough work ahead, as the clock ticks towards the deadline from the ambitious 2020 goals. This government has essentially three more years to eradicate poverty, provide nationwide Internet access, and create a moderately prosperous society for all. For more on the annual two sessions and China's economy, we are joined in our Beijing studio Liu Baocheng, the Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. Welcome, sir. In New York, we have Fred Tang, the president of the America-China Public Affairs Institute. He's also a specially invited overseas observer for this year's two sessions. Welcome, uh, Fred, back to our program. Meanwhile, joining us in Washington, D.C., in the U.S., we invited Nicholas Lardy, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Welcome as well, Mr. Lardy. Let me begin with you, Professor Liu, briefly. What do you think this two session could mean for the Chinese economy? Structural reform, how fast can they be done? Well, uh, it is really a real reference of, of uh, what was uh, uh, carried out uh, since the uh, 19th uh, uh, party session at the end of last year. And the quality growth is the key, but based on which supply side reform shall continue. And there are also uh, quantitative figures that they need to achieve. Mm -hmm. On the other, financial stability is also a very important factor. And in the meantime, uh, how to structure the uh, uh, Chinese uh, upgrading of uh, trade composition and also industrial uh, composition. Right. That's probably the whole government work report that you're talking about over there. But having said that, though, Mr. Chang, here's the thing. The two sessions this year mainly have been talking about one important issue, that is the party leadership. How should we understand the concept, the ultimate party leadership, and also as decided by the earlier party congress that let the market play a decisive role. How should we see these two concepts together? 
I think it's not just the party leadership, but also the, the structure of the governance. Uh, we, we see this, uh, I, I see this as a very, very strong team that President Xi was able to put together. And, and this team can be multifaceted. It is in each of these problems that they tackle, they have multiple individuals, multiple leaders can and tackle these issues. And these are all people that he has worked with and mm -hmm. have tremendous experience. Leadership team, is that enough, Mr. Lardy? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly a very strong beginning. I think that with people like Liu He and Yi Gang in, in key positions that um, I think that reflects a determination that uh, she has been speaking of for more than a year to reduce uh, financial risk. Mm -hmm. But what about the reforms, for example? As we know, it's not just about the reducing the financial risk. It's also about pushing forward the, the reform agenda. That's another thing that two sides have to work together. On the one hand, you need to have certain kinds of monitoring and security measures. But on the other hand, you did need to push forward the reform agenda, which was also what President Xi committed when he was elected General Secretary of the CPC. Well, <coughs> I think the reform uh, agenda has not been strongly pursued over the last couple of years. They have re-emphasized the role of big state companies. Uh, now we're seeing an emphasis on the role of the party. And the efficiency of the state-owned sector <coughs> continues to deteriorate and is dragging down China's economic growth. So there were a few things in the work report that were positive, price reform, uh, the decisive role for the market, but I think we'll have to actually wait and see uh, what materializes over the next few years in terms of the reform agenda. Mm. There seems to be a contradiction between the rhetoric on the one hand and what we actually see on the ground on the other. Mm. Related to that question, China plans this time to pull out all the stops in carrying out economic reform this year according to the official stance. Several ministries have been mapped out. There are strategies in fixing key areas such as trade and taxes. Here's a quick look. Let's take a look at this. Maintaining a neutral monetary policy and diffusing financial risks are on top of the central bank's to-do list. Newly elected PBOC Governor Yi Gang said that China would maintain its current monetary policies, control the money supply, and continue credit and social financing growth at a reasonable pace. He also emphasized advancing financial reforms, such as the marketization of interest rates. Trade is another pillar of China's economy. The Ministry of Commerce said that China would seek high-quality trade through innovation. But we should also be aware that China still remains the major trading power, but not a quality trader. And to be a quality trader, we must be committed to the principle of being guided by innovation, and we must also embark on a path of high-quality development. Meanwhile, the finance ministry said it would maintain a proactive fiscal policy and advance tax reforms. The ministry said the government would continue to cut corporate taxes, especially for small and medium-sized companies. The ministry said that China would also lower the broad tax rate for such sectors as manufacturing and transportation. The ministry also warned that it would keep an eye on local government debt to fend off risks. Mm. I think that's a key question, isn't it? If you have to look at the, all of these measures, a lot of info to digest during the two sessions time, the annual political season in China. But Mr. Tang, once again, how can we understand that? Can the two concepts reconcile and probably even work together with one another? That is, one is the party leadership and the governance modernization. The other is, of course, the reform and let market play a decisive role. From the economic and financial perspective, how would you see that? Well, the open and reform policy established by Deng Xiaoping is enjoying its 40th anniversary. I think the reform starts with government. And this time, the government has restructured, pared down eight of its ministry, seven of its sub-ministries, and this is a beginning, because if the government has lots of redundancies, you really cannot uh, reform other structures of, of, of the country. So this is a beginning, but I also see this is not the end, meaning that there will be further uh, 
you know, adjustments in terms of government ministries and so forth. There's just too many ministries because of the legacy issues. Mm. This is not just the end, but rather the beginning. Professor Liu, besides the government's uh, efficiency to be improved by doing institutional reform regarding the government structure, uh, it's probably also about policies and how to implement the policies and to see whether the policies could work and to what extent to adjust the policies, Professor. Well, uh, right now the uh, government is facing a very uh, different reality as compared to even with five years ago. Uh, on the international front, the, there is growing protectionism and uh, politically there is growing popularism and uh, 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 global competition uh, is really changing the landscape eternally. Uh, the reform is really treading into the uh, deep water uh, where uh, uh, many of those interest groups are uh, still uh, playing a very important role uh, in uh, obstructing mm. the uh, further progress of uh, uh, government innovation. Yeah. And uh, also the uh, uh, government will need to be adjusted not only in terms of the organization, but also in its real function, its service to uh, business and to the society. So they need constant adjustment to face the new reality. Right. Mr. Lardy, a lot of concepts flying around, as you may know, every time during China's uh, political season. This is an interesting time to look at the China's future direction. So some of the things regarding what have we have just talked about. You see from the Chinese leadership increasing talks about how the economy which is now unbalanced and inefficient, should develop in a way to satisfy the ever-growing desire of the public and of the people to have better lives. You also have the external pressure in a way on China. For example, U.S.-China trade. Now some even talk about the trade war. I'm not sure whether that is the right word to use, by the way. So how will the internal desire, in a way, coming from the people, and the external pressure in a way that could lead to some devastating situation, hopefully not, eventually work in a way to make China's reform being pushed even further? Well, I think we have to begin by recognizing that, that China has done extraordinarily well in terms of raising sure. living standards in China. The growth of the growth of per capita income over the last few years has exceeded the growth of GDP and so wages are rising rapidly uh, other positive factors are improving the government has built out the social safety net mm -hmm. to a very substantial degree over recent years so I think the I think the foundation is good you're absolutely right the risks come on the external side if the United States pursues the strategy that it uh, has indicated that it will uh, over the next few days, uh, we could find ourselves in a very substantial trade war between uh, China and the United States. I don't think anybody's in position would be improved. Both countries uh, would lose. Uh, and so that, that would certainly be a setback uh, for sustaining China's uh, economic growth. How large it would be, I think, remains to be seen. We need to look carefully at the details of whatever protectionist measures are adopted uh, by the United States. Mm. Professor Liu, it's not a once, not twice, not three times, not four times that top government officials from China are being asked during the two sessions about what if the U.S. took certain action and how would China react and whether there was going to be a war. It <coughs> seemed all of them, coming from the Chinese side, seemed quite graceful and saying this should not be the way. We do not want that to happen. We hope it's not going to happen, but it takes two to tangle. So, Professor Liu, given that what Mr. Lardy just warned, the change of weather in Washington toward China, how is China at the time pushing its reform agenda while at the same time facing these kinds of very unpredictable possibilities? Well, uh, Chinese economic size is there. Uh, is getting stronger, <clears throat> but in the meantime, the interdependence uh, uh, of uh, economic relations uh, between China and the U.S. is also getting very strong. So, therefore, between the two biggest economies, if I mean, if there is going to be a trade war, both sides uh, are ready to lose. 
but I do not think the, uh, uh, even the U.S. politics can really afford the uh, complete uh, you know, shutdown uh, of uh, trade mm. and economic ties with China. But in the meantime, the uncertainty is really looming large. Uh, so therefore, China, uh, on, on one hand, we are uh, preparing for a uh, uh, multi-tier dialogue with uh, the United States. But uh, uh, in the meantime, China will have to be ready to shift uh, more of the diversification with, of the market and also uh, get ready to upgrade its uh, 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 economic value mm. uh, so that they will uh, avoid uh, many of those charges like anti-dumping, right. uh, etc. So, and also the Chinese uh, uh, companies who are going to invest abroad, they have to look uh, more carefully, look at the political risk, and also uh, you know, they uh, uh, found a better opportunity to really to cash you know, so that they can really prevent right. uh, more of those risks. Well, this is coming at a time when China, after 40 years of reform and opening up, and certainly enjoyed a lot of positive results at a critical juncture. Mr. Tang, you may know this very well. While you were as a special MIT attending this year's two sessions, a lot of issues related to people's livelihood that really has to cash in. People want that. For example, about education, about welfare, about um, Medicare, about some of the other issues like aging population, about 200 million of them already as part of the population that are senior age. So all of this jammed together at a time when China is rising but facing a lot of international pressure as well, internally still need to restructure itself. So a lot of places that would need attention. So where is the beginning? What is the best way to do it? That's being discussed so much during the two sessions, Mr. Tong. Well, this is where I'm most impressed about uh, attending and observing the two sessions. Because what I see is Chinese leaders and the Chinese government is talking about the quality of life of people. They realize there are a lot, a lot of issues to be uh, their challenges. However, they look at these problems and then they're trying to solve these problems rather than just dealing with politics or talking about non-productive uh, issues. So I think that by first, you have to recognize what your problems are, and second is how to deal with them. So uh, the goals that they have set are very, very ambitious, but in these day and age, a lot of people will give China credit that they might actually achieve all of these goals. Mm. Mr. Lardy, your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I agree. I think uh, they certainly set out a very ambitious agenda on improving, uh, improving the environment, improving uh, people's welfare. And as I said before, I think they're making uh, significant progress on many of these goals. Some of them are extremely challenging. And, uh, you know, they've reorganized the government in a way they think will uh, increase their ability to, to deliver on the various promises that have been made. So we'll just have to wait and, wait and see what actually happens. Mm. Professor Liu, this is going to be a few very critical year, as we may know. In the next two to three and even five years during the term of this new government, a lot of change in the world and China's impact onto the world could also be changing as a result. The best way to deal with all of these uncertainties at the same time, it's like a chess, isn't it? You have a lot of areas to take care of. Well, at the same time, you need to have the streamline of the strategy. Professor Dill, three, four, and Yes, uh, that's the challenge of managing complexity with too many variables in hand. But in the, uh, uh, to, to tackle this complexity, uh, you have to be very firm on the ultimate goal, which is really to uh, raise people's uh, living standard and also make people happy. And uh, by doing that, so you need to uh, you know, keep the uh, economy steadily growing and mm -hmm. also manage a uh, peaceful international relationship by uh, moving forward with restructuring and innovation. A lot of tasks, certainly. After the two sessions, a lot of things need to be sorted out. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Liu Baocheng, Fred Tang, and Nicholas Lardy. It's such a pleasure to see the three of you once again. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Stay with us here at World Insight. Still to come on our program, no expansion and a shared future through good relations with all nations. 
Chinese Premier Li Keqiang during his annual press conference spells out China's foreign policy. Our panelists weigh in right after this break. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. After talking about China's economic roadmap in the two sessions, let's focus on diplomacy. Earlier today, after wrapping up of the first session of the 13th National People's Congress, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang during his annual press conference briefed the media at the Golden Hall inside the Great Hall of the People. In the meeting, Premier Li took questions from journalists from, from home and abroad, and he said China has no intention to pursue expansion. Take a listen. China has achieved its development in a peaceful international environment. I want to emphasize two points. One, China will not seek expansion. It is now a developing country and it has no intention to pursue expansion. What China wants is to develop relations with all other countries and regions on the basis of mutual respect and mutual benefits, and to work with others to build a community with a shared future. For more on the annual two sessions and China's foreign policy, let's join Wang Yiwei, who is a Zhang Monet Chair Professor of Renmin University. He's also the director of the Center for European Studies. Welcome, sir, to our program. Meanwhile, joining us once again in New York, Fred Tang, the president of America China Public Affairs Institute, especially invitee of uh, this year's two sessions. And uh, we are hoping another American guest is going to join us in a few minutes before that happens. Let me go to you, Mr. Tang, about the China's foreign policy. Certainly, China has to explain a lot to the rest of the world about what exactly its agenda is. Uh, what do you think exactly it is? Well, I think this time uh, President Xi has a very strong team, a hand-picked and strategically placed team. Not only himself, but his vice president, Mr. Wang Qishan, is very well versed at dealing internationally. His vice premier, Mr. Liu He, is very, very well versed in dealing with international community. The, the foreign minister and state counselor, Mr. Mr. Wang Yi, again, is very, very well versed in dealing with it. So he has a very strong team, and including Mr. Wang Yang, the chairman of CPPCC, who can do people-to-people -people exchange. So he has a very strong international team that can be dispatched anytime and to deal with any of the issues. Mm. So I think that is really what's going on in terms of the foreign diplomacy. Uh, President Xi has it pretty much ready. Mm. It seems that Mr. Tang wants to stick to his point about a strong team could make a lot of things happen. But to you, uh, Professor Wang, uh, strategically, is Chinese foreign policy have any shift of focus, let's just say, compared to decades ago? Well, a continuity, I think, the first uh, mm -hmm. Chinese. Uh, but if there's a shift, uh, means the Chinese economic growth uh, structure uh, shift from uh, export to import to uh, attract FDI to invest a lot uh, along the Belt Road countries. So, of course, the uh, Chinese foreign policy will uh, accordingly uh, will, uh, more uh, uh, active and uh, provide the public goods with the world and uh, more focus on the global governance. Mm. And of course, one of the most important bilateral relations China has to deal with is the U.S.-China relations, which these days have attracted so much attention, always in the headline, no matter what the tweets are. So, <laughs> Mr. Paul, coming from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, he's the vice president there, Douglas Paul. Welcome to our program as well. Thank you for taking our time, sir. So what do you say with the words and also the concepts flying around during the two sessions. Do you have a better idea of the future direction of China foreign policy, particularly regarding China's relations with the United States? Well, you know, I, if I have to draw a broad conclusion, I think China's mo uh, major priorities are mostly domestic, and that China is looking to uh, protect its interests and its uh, claims to sovereignty in, in its nearby neighborhood and is not looking for a conflict with the United States. Uh, I, I think you can make those general characterizations. But when you talk about the nearby sovereignty claims, the so-called core interests, 
Uh, there are areas where the U.S. and China will rub up against each other. And I think the summary speech by President Xi uh, touched on this question a bit indirectly in talking about avoiding splitism and uh, indirectly referencing Taiwan as, a, uh, as an issue. Mm. Professor Wang, about that, the two issues. Uh, two issues for China's relationship with the United States, trade. One uh, that mentioned is that, of course, the Taiwan Act that uh, mm -hmm. has been recently debated so much, mm -hmm. uh, a legislation put forward by yeah, President yeah. Trump and also the Capitol Hill. The other thing, of course, mm -hmm. is the trade the issue between China and the United States. First about trade, I think the, the uh, President Trump wants to use the trade to divide and rule of the world, uh, including the European countries. Some of the European countries want to seek exemption from the United States and then others will be punished, uh, mm. like Germany, and uh, because of sales too much steel to the United States and China also. So which make China and uh, Germany should work more closely, actually, uh, uh, to fight against the protectionism. For Taiwan, uh, uh, President Trump, you know, uh, Plan again, again, uh, of the card of the Taiwan issue and make more, want to make a deal with uh, China. So uh, Taiwan issue and trade, they will uh, make a deal comprehensively with the Chinese government. Will China make a deal about China? They Taiwan? want to make a deal. They want to make a deal. Yeah. They but want will to China make a deal with about the issue no, of Taiwan? No. Uh, for, for China, ta definitely. Taiwan is our core national interest about domestic affairs, which cannot be, uh, be negotiated uh, and uh, not be trade off. But uh, Trump, because it's uh, from commercial consideration right. they won't make a deal. Right. We all understand that logic, but the thing is how to proceed from here. Uh, used as a bargaining chip, that could be understandable, but China has its own principle, Mr. Tang. Well, I think that it would be a mistake well, to I think use there are as a bargaining there, there, there chip. There are Mr. Oh, Tang, please, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Sorry, Doc. Uh, well, I, I think it would be a, a mistake to use this as a bargaining chip, and we, we, we saw that through the co phone conversation early on when President uh, Trump won the election. Uh, I do think that uh, this is a, a, a unilateral decision where President Trump signed the act, and there are many people on Taiwan is very worried what is the implication for such act. Actually, the traveling has been going on for a long time, but then it's just not necessary to have such an act to enact it. Mm. Mr. Paul. Well, I think the Taiwan Travel uh, Act is a way for Congress to express its unhappiness with China and its support for the values Taiwan uh, encapsulates, and not much more than that. I don't think it changes anything in the behavior of the administration, and I'm not seeing strong incentives from the administration to uh, try to play Taiwan as a card against China. That doesn't seem to be in their thinking, at least at the present moment. Although there are, you can find individuals here and there who might want to do that. Mm. Uh, Mr. Paul, just to follow up on that, uh, over the past few months, you have seen a whole change, sea change of personnel surrounding President Trump. Uh, the kinds of people that he has selected into the closest circle of his. Uh, what kinds of policy tendency do you think this circle of people likely to produce? And how do you think for those of many of you who are here right on the screen have been experts of U.S.-China relations, uh, the, the two countries lead to the right direction when it comes to bilateral relations? Mr. Paul. Well, I think we've seen a, an increase in the number of people who support the president's instincts to take confrontational approaches on most issues, uh, with the big exception of how to deal with North Korea. And there it's a mixture of cooperation and confrontation. Uh, and I think that's likely to be the direction we're headed in. I, I see U.S.-China relations getting about as bad as they were in the uh, late 1980s, early 90s, uh, once again. Mm. But Professor Wang, 80s and 90s, China was not as it is today. Today, China is stronger. I'm not saying China is going to, in a way, exercise its muscle. It's just that China has its own desire, and China needs to have its own way of development that is ever clearer. So, Professor Wang, how should we understand the current circumstances if what Mr. Paul said are exactly what is happening right now? Well, it's not just because of the rise of the Chinese power. It's because of the rise also responsibility because uh, Chinese interests 
more and more are connected with the, uh, other countries. Mm. Now China pay more attention to the international environment, not just for uh, considering of the threat and risks, but also uh, we shall put forward so the community of the shared future because the world, uh, uh, I think, is very uncertainty. Our Chinese uh, economic relations, uh, political relations, security relations is highly interdependent with the outside. So that's the uh, reason China pay more attention to that. Mm. China, of course, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, Mr. Tang, uh, in the last day of the 13th uh, MPC, he delivered a very long speech talking about some of the very specific concepts regarding the Chinese nation, the Chinese people, the Chinese history, and the Chinese vision. One of the things he's been talking about is, of course, the future direction. And he's talking about the Chinese spirit, the can-do spirit, the innovative spirit. Uh, these all, in a way, is trying, in a way, to tell the rest of the world what does China want and where is China heading for, given what you have just read and listened to the Chinese president, and also given what the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang during his annual press conference said, the relationship between China and the United States is going to be one between the largest developed economy and the largest developing economy. It seems that it's two categories we're talking about, not just two countries anymore. So how should we understand the next stage when it comes to the nature of relations between these two countries and how the two countries are likely to rally the strength in order to make sure it is in its own interest, but at the same time mutual interest as well. Mr. Chen. I'm actually quite optimistic about the U.S.-China relations. What we see in the media these days, or from the tweet, tweeting going on, it really reflects of our current presidency and his administration, or his small circle of people. Um, I think that, you know, it is just our president's personality and it's really not, it's not reflect the true U.S.-China relations. Uh, like per, uh, uh, Professor Wang earlier had talked about, also China's relations no longer is just a U.S.-China relation, but a global relationship. With its Belt and Road Initiative and so many other things, it has engaged so many nations very, very deeply. And it can, you know, obviously uh, ignore part of the U.S. Uh, rhetoric, and they can go on you know, working with other nations and still building its economy and building its international relations. Mm. Mr. Paul, what about your thought? Well, I, I can understand the position just expressed, but I, I do think that the administration, which had a, a kind of a balance for the first year between people who really wanted to change everything that the U.S. government does, especially with regard to China, uh, to, and then balanced against uh, more institutional interests, long-term interests. I think the balance has really shifted to uh, disruption toward change. Therefore, we're going to see er very soon the Section 301 measures taken to attack the large deficit that the United States has in trade with China. Mm. Uh, this will be complicated. It will be uh, very difficult to to, to make happen, but they seem to be determined to press ahead with that, and it will be natural for China to respond in ways that will be pretty right. strong as well. Okay. Professor Wang, here's the question. Whether the two countries, China and United States, is likely to go into a trade war or not, we discuss it many times, even today, in our program. But let's just put that aside. Let's just say if things were getting worse, is China going to have an alternative? with which that China does not have to sacrifice too much of its uh, current um, conditions when it comes to trade and economic development, while at the same time be able to uh, go around the United States in a way, at least the difficulties that the United States is trying to create for China right now. Professor Wang. I think the trade war, so-called trade war, I think the behind it is about uh, uh, the responsibility of the global financial crisis and uh, about the uh, world economy. Why Chinese government always highlights uh, is the developing country and the developed country uh, economy. Because about the steel, our capacity is a global phenomenon. Uh, the concern from China, from Germany, is because of uh, the global division of labor. It's not because of China uh, have the intention to seek the uh, imbalance. So I think that we are uh, persuaded uh, President Trump to understand the Globalization from a uh, more uh, global perspective, not from the U.S., uh, very narrow and uh, unilateral uh, 
uh, perspective. Mm. What about the alternative way, uh, Mr. Paul? If the U.S. politics continue to be what it is, well, of course, nobody could control it except those in the United States. So, uh, what would be the strategy if you could advise, uh, in a way, for China? For China? Well, I, I think that um, China's, as I said at the outset, China's focus on domestic issues with uh, expanding interests abroad uh, is something that should be continued. What's being observed most closely in the U.S. are tendencies for China to try to disturb the international system. And if I could recommend anything to be included in the leadership speeches in right. China, it would be to repeat the things that were said in Geneva and Davos in January by President Xi, which talked about preserving and improving the international order, right. not trying to overturn it. Okay. Professor Wang, final words very briefly. Uh, no one wants to overthrow the international order. China and the United States benefit from this, but both of sides, because the number one, number two world economy, should reform this international system to make it more inclusive, more sustainable. This our should jointly to work for that, not uh, compete and uh, confront the each other. All right. There we go. A lot of discussion going on there. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Uh, Wang Yiwei, Fred Tang, Douglas Paul. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Before we go, we'll leave you with the top sights and sounds from the two sessions. As a recap of this year's political season, we'll leave you with words from a Chinese sage who once said that running a big country is like cooking a small meal. Here's a quick look at how the Chinese government prepared all the ingredients on hand to take on the huge task. <laughs> Running a big country is like cooking a small meal. That is a quote coming from Dao Te Ching. That's an ancient classic Chinese credited to the ancient Chinese sage Lao Tzu. But the logic is the same. Responsibilities are much bigger as we're talking about the lives of 1.4 billion people. And that is what the Chinese government has committed to do. There are some important elements already. After years of hard work, the anti-corruption drive has achieved some impressive results, and it's visible everywhere. Just to give you a small example, there are slogans shown in the most visible places in the lobby of hotels where NPC deputies and CPPCC members stay during the two sessions. They are reminding everyone to be self-disciplined. More importantly, the institutional building has been set up, crystallized by the establishment of the National Supervision Commission to root out corruption both within the Chinese Communist Party and at all levels of the government. China's contribution is not only its work from within, but also beyond borders. It has been the growth engine of the world economy for quite some time. Yet the question is, the Chinese economy itself has run into problems of its own. It's too export-oriented and lack of quality growth. The supply-side structural reform has been identified to be key in meeting the rising demands of the Chinese people to have a better life. But where are the entry points for the important work to be done? Well, it is the well-known three battles, namely to deal with environmental pollution, extreme poverty, as well as the risks of the financial sector. But the question is how? Institutional reform plan has mapped it out. For example, combining the Banking Regulatory Commission and the Insurance Regulatory Commission to deal with the newly emerged risks throughout the financial sector. Another example, the establishment of the Ministry of Ecological Environment to put all environmental protection work under one umbrella. For instance, water pollution. It used to be that different agencies under different ministries handle work related to groundwater, water management, and rural water pollution, but now with all of these functions under one roof, it could serve as a new momentum to make things work. After all, efficiency is crucial for governance. All the above mentioned examples, as well as the reduction of ministerial entities according to the latest institutional reform plan, is designed to do the job. Knowing the pain points, designing the plan with clear reflection is always the most important step taken for good governance. It seems that China and the Chinese Communist Party have been pondering upon that question constantly over the past five years. Now, with a clear plan, it already has its work cut out for it. 
That was earlier in the Great Hall of the People. Well, after 18 days of coverage, our special programs and straight talk interview series has come to an end for the annual political season. We want to appreciate your attention. Well, at the same time, continue to pay attention to our program, World Inside with me, Tian Wei. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team who have been working very hard over the past 18 years, 18 days rather, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for Insights Across China and Around the World. Good night.